Welcome to Bible Explorations. This is the time for an enlightening adventure in the Word of God. To make this study more meaningful, we suggest that you use three basic tools, a good sharp pencil, a notepad, and of course, the Bible. We recommend the King James translation, however any good translation will do. One word of caution. Most Bible students do not use paraphrased editions for their more serious study. We will be using the King James translation. So right now, let's join in prayer before we begin this exciting Bible adventure. It's with bowed heads and dedicated hearts that we approach thee, Lord. We approach thee for wisdom, wisdom we believe we need. You've promised more and more light to shine on our path as we approach that perfect day. That glorious perfect day when you return to planet Earth to take us all home at last. We do believe that day is approaching, so please, God, share with us more of this light, we ask in thy holy name. Amen. Welcome to another Bible study with Bible Explorations. I'm happy to be together with you again, and I say again very seriously. Let me put it this way. If you have not yet seen the video or studied the subject, the mark of the beast, and the subject, the tribulation, stop your VCR right now and rewind it, for the things on this video will be misunderstood. Be sure to see the mark of the beast and the tribulation before enjoying this lecture. In the study of the Mark of the Beast, we learned about the three main sins involved. Blasphemy, the transgression of the first commandment. Persecution, the blasphemy of the second commandment. And, of course, the fornication of God's fourth commandment. The commandment reads, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The definite article is used on the seventh day. There's no question which day. And once again, if you have missed the previous subjects, please stop and not go ahead with this one. This is the most uniformly and fornicated of all God's commandments, this Sabbath command. Now, one church puts it this way, and it's interesting. I don't want to put blame in one direction, but for the sake of history, it's interesting from our Sunday visitor, January 4, 1931, Christendom is indebted to the Catholic Church for the institution of Sunday as a Sabbath day, but there is no precedent in Scripture nor commandment in Scripture to observe Sunday as the Sabbath day. Well, we all really know that, those that want to be honest with ourselves. Tonight, we're going to step through the curtain of prophecy and look deeply into the issue at the particular area of the planet to which we are indebted for this fornication of God's command. But first, let's review a few verses. We're going to look at Revelation 14, verse 6 through 10. Please turn in your Bible. Please read the words for yourself. This is a repeat. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and to every kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Obviously the setting of the judgment. His judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and fountains of waters. This is God's command regarding this issue of the mark of the beast. It is his only command regarding the issue of the mark of the beast. So he had best take it very seriously. We are to worship God as creator of heaven, earth, and sea. And those of you who have studied before know in the scriptures that there's only one place that tells us how. And of course that's in the fourth commandment. Now in verse 8, it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
Babylon has fornicated God's command of worship, and none of the nations of the world are truly enraptured with God's command of worship. Not today. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If any man, any individual, no matter who he is, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. A very strong warning regarding this issue. An image of God's command has been made. God's command was fornicated, and an image of it has been put in its place. In these verses, we see all nations will go along with the fornication of God's command, and each individual that accepts it will eventually suffer the wrath of God. That's why the Lord puts the message in the book, because there's no need in anyone suffering the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God is really divided into seven plagues, into seven vials holding the seven last plagues. I want you to see this in the 15th chapter in the first verse, where he simply says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So in our first text, we see those who have the mark of the beast will suffer the wrath of God. In the very next chapter, he explains the wrath of God in the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues will fall on those who have the mark of the beast. In fact, in chapter uh, 16, verse 2, you'll see that very clearly. And the first, the first angel went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. The beast has an image that it is made of God's command. And everyone's worshiping according to that. In verse 10, it says, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. You remember it was first pagan Rome that held this seat, and then gave it to the Christian church as we studied when we studied the mark of the beast. A quick review of just a few of those verses in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, where John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. Notice, horns, crowns, blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, his mouth the mouth of the lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. The dragon gave this beast its place to reign. After pagan Rome gave the church her seat in Rome, she ruled and she often persecuted as we've studied before. In fact, without any real state interference for some 1260 years, time, time and a half time, 40 and two spiritual months. The years we learned were from 538 to 1798. It was in 1798, you remember, that Berthier went down to the Sistine Chapel and took the prisoner, the gentlemanly, but then powerless, Pope Pius VI prisoner, and took him away from the throne and away from Rome where he died in exile. After the deadly wound in 1798, its influence re-emerges and the beast eventually receives the spotlight of the world. In verse 3, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded, 1798, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. All the world. That's never happened before really. All the world. That would mean the Muslim world, wouldn't it? That would mean China, Japan, that would mean the United States, that would mean Europe, that would mean all the world wandered after the beast. There has to be some kind of a world organization for this to happen. It is the final and last phase of the beast and his city codenamed Babylon that we're going to study this subject. I mentioned some of the seven last plagues are heading her way. We've seen one of them. We'll look at another in Revelation 16, 12. Where here it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the ways of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
Well, great river Euphrates. Euphrates used to feed what great city? In ancient times, it was Babylon. The Euphrates River ran right through it. The river Euphrates used to feed ancient Babylon. Notice another of the plagues that are headed for her. Revelation 16, verse 17 and 18. Now, as we're talking about the Euphrates River and Babylon, we're using symbolic language, of course, because Euphrates is there, but ancient Babylon has been gone for centuries. Uh, the country of Iraq would like to rebuild it, so uh, we understand, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. So Babylon is symbolic of this city codenamed Babylon. In verse 17, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Whose voice is that? Who said, It is done, when he hung on a cross? When he hung on a cross, a certain phase of salvation was accomplished. It was done. Now another phase of salvation is accomplished in the seventh angel when he pours out his vial upon the earth. Verse 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Not only the city codenamed Babylon, but all the nations that went along with their fornication are falling also. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. The fourth commandment is internationally fornicated. And here we are, as the historian wrote, indebted to Rome. This is a very, very important subject. And John the Revelator is literally getting heavy with information. It's enough to catch one's breath away. While he's talking to this angel that's, that's describing the plagues, one of them comes to him. I, I want you to notice this wonderful scene in chapter 17, verse 1 of the book of Revelation. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, Come hither. Would you like an angel to do that for you? Come over here. I want to talk with you. And that's what's happening here. Come hither. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore which sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The fornication began in Revelation 14. We studied that. It's the same fornication carrying all the way through this book. Two things are obvious. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming to the fallen church. The woman representing a church, a church in a fallen condition. She's called a great whore here. Secondly, her worldwide influence has caused the fornication of God's most holy command. Notice the color on the, of the beast on which she rides. In verse 3, you'll find it solid red. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, from previous study, you already know that a woman represents a church, but what about this red beast with seven heads and ten horns? Well, John the Revelator has explained that already, too. It's interesting how he makes a statement, and then he just carries the theme on through. If you remember in Revelation chapter 12, he explained the red beast with seven heads and ten horns. In verse 3 it read, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. There he is. And in verse 9 it describes him completely. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He deceives the whole world. The whole world is fornicating God's command. In the first vision, he had ten crowns. But in a later vision, he has no crowns. And we'll explain that a little bit, a little bit later. Let's read verses 4 to 6. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. If this is the fallen church, then it's really Satan's church. And if you should study the truth about Satan, you'll find he's dressed pretty much like his church is. 
For the Bible barely well tells us in Ezekiel that this is the way he was dressed as well. So there's more than just symbology here. There's symbology, but there's enough reality for us to put two and two together. In verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with great admiration. Many Bibles say great amazement. You see, John is literally amazed to see the return of persecution in the last days at the hands of this situation. Notice she has daughters, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. What does it mean, the mother of harlots? A mother can have a daughter, the mother can be a harlot, but the daughter doesn't have to be. When does the daughter become a harlot? When the daughter does what the mother does. And what was the mother doing? She was committing fornication with the kings of the earth, in verse 2. So when the daughters start putting their transgression laws into the uh, fabric of the government of countries, when you begin to see the separation of church and state barrier taken down and the church starting influencing the state again, when you begin to see the state enforcing the values of the church, watch out, watch out. That's what the mother did influence the kings of the earth. And when the daughters do the same, watch out. Literally, John is amazed with great amazement at the rate of the return of persecution in the last days. Now, the angel gives more explanation and promises more explanation in verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth on her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. So the mystery of the future is beginning to unravel. He's going to explain the identity of the mother church and the identity of the beast that carries her. We've already recognized from John's own work who the real beast is, but he's given more positive identification in verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. The beast was seen at one time, in the Garden of Eden at least, was not seen for a long time, but will go into the bottomless pit. John the Revelator, would you please explain? And John the Revelator says, yes, of course I'll explain. If you look in the 20th chapter of my book, You'll see there that Satan is the only one that goes in and out of the bottomless pit by name. Oh, there'll be others go into the bottomless pit. No question about that. The Bible talks about it. But only one has a name, and that's Satan, Lucifer. He's the one that's named by John the Revelator as going in and out of the bottomless pit. Verse 8 continues. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder. Well, which people are going to wonder? Oh, those whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, that they be, when, when they behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is. People will actually behold him? Absolutely, that's what the scripture says. Here it says that the wicked will wonder when they behold Satan. Next, John is told more about the woman. First, her location is identified in verses 9 through 11. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Some scriptures have altered this a little bit since, but King James puts it pretty straight. Somewhere she's sitting on a city with seven hills. And then in verse 10, and there are seven kings. Some modern versions leave the word and out. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is. There's present tense. The other is not yet come, that's future. And when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. Evidently, the seventh one isn't going to be around very long. But God wants his present truth, present generation people in this setting to know when the sixth king is. 
You see, in verse 10, the sixth king is in the present tense. In verse 8, the eighth and final king is also in the present tense. The beast that was and is not and yet is. Obviously, there's going to be a generation that sees the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth king. Well, what generation is it? Well, it's the final generation. How do you know? Number one, it's the plague angel explaining why the plagues fall and the plagues fall in the final generation. Number two, notice verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So obviously, we're looking at a time when the final and eighth king reigns and he's going into perdition when Jesus comes. Satan is unmasked to those who understand. Obviously, Satan will emerge on earth as the eighth king. So the people of the world will behold him for the first time. In spite of all the power and prestige that the Antichrist is going to have in the time of the end, he will not be able to destroy God's 144,000 sealed saints. And I want you to see this in Revelation 9, 4, and 5. In fact, I want you to be one of them. And there's no reason why you can't be. That's a bold statement, but it's true. Chapter 9, verse 4. Speaking of the enemy, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Those who are sealed of God will not be hurt by Satan's final warfare. Verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, at the first verse, in verse 4, they were not allowed to hurt those who have the seal of God. They're sealed in the seventh chapter. Uh, you remember in the seventh chapter where it says, Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we sealed our servants of our God in their foreheads. Verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000, and so on and so forth. We're going to study the 144,000 one of these times. And you're just going to be sitting on the edges of your seat. I know you are. Because you could very well be one of them, and you need to be informed. I would enjoy describing the demonic-inspired warfare in the next few verses. When it speaks of scorpions, so did Jesus in Luke 10, 19 and 20, and he described them as demons. It appears that demons and humans will be involved here. And they had a king over them, and who was it? Notice verse 11, please. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. There's the eighth king. He's the king. He's over them, and he's the angel of the bottomless pit. And who's that? Oh, some of the higher critics will say it's this, that, or the other thing. Some great program here or there. But the truth is, it's given to the simple. The king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. The, the Greek word Apollyon means destroyer. Uh, I had some uh, friends who were from Greece sitting in the front row of a series of meetings once, and they, they, they wrote out all of the frames of this word in Greece from Apollyon, and it came out the lost. The lost one is the king. The destroyer is the eighth king. The destroyer is the one who is over this demon-human warfare, but they cannot kill the 144,000. Well, John the Revelator is even getting heavier with information, isn't he? It's getting almost as much as a person can handle. I'm going to put a chart up on the screen for you to help compare past history with present or with future prophecy. The similarities of the Dark Ages beast of Daniel 7 and the emergence of the New World beast, order beast of Revelation 13, and this final beast of Revelation 17, which we're studying tonight, is most interesting. You and I have already studied Daniel 7. If you haven't, you shouldn't be watching this. We've studied the Mark of the East in Revelation 13. If you haven't, you shouldn't be watching this. But we're looking at the final beast. Now, all three of these, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, all three of these beasts have seven heads and ten horns. All three blaspheme and persecute. And all three have their home base in Rome. We've studied two of them already. But there are many more differences between this last beast and the former two than there are likenesses. 
Only this one in Revelation 17 has eight kings. Neither of the other two do. Only this one has no crowns on his horns. The other ones have crowns on their horns. Only this one has mature daughters. This gets no healing once it receives its wound. It's wounded under death and given to the burning flame. There's no healing of a deadly wound in this beast. In this beast, the ten horns come up last rather than first before the beast that reigns upon the throne. And this beast, the ten horns don't last very long. In our study of the Dark Ages, those horn powers lasted several years. But in this case, the ten horns reign one hour with the beast. In this beast, all ten horns begin supporting the Antichrist. But of course, you remember in the uh, Dark Ages situation, uh, or, or when we had those ten horns before, three of them were uprooted because it wouldn't support. But all ten of these do. And all ten eventually hate the whore. And all ten are there to fight Christ when he returns. That's not true of either of the previous beasts. And this beast is only one color. Red. The others, of course, were multicolored. The colors of a lion, the colors of a bear, the colors of a leopard. Back in Revelation 13, the dragon gave the beast its seat and power. But in this case, the Antichrist takes it and reigns on it himself, clear to the end. There is a difference. Uh, let's go back to review for just a moment of Revelation 13. And notice the graph. The 1260 years, it began in 5, 5, 538. And I saw one of his heads wounded unto death. And the wound took place that we studied in 1798. This is the multicolored beast made up of many body parts of various animals. We see the ten horns, and we've looked at them before, representing the Alamanni, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Heruli, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, Suevi, Saxons, Visigoths, and Vandals. We've studied these things before. And then the, eight, the, the heads on the other side. Oh, there are so many different ideas about the seven heads. It's absolutely amazing. Different commentaries have different ideas about these heads. So I'll give one of my own. may not be worth much, but I'll just hand it out there. The seven heads are the seven powers that blasphemed God, trying to take God's place, persecuted God's people, and was involved in Babylonian worship. I would like to say the first head represented Babel, where sun worship began. In the land of Shinar, where the cities of Babel, Akkad, Kelna, and Erech, whose king Nimrod started sun worship and warred with the pure children of Seth. Then I would go to the second head and look at Egypt, where the city Heliopolis, the city of the sun, was its main uh, uh, forte. It was Egypt that kept God's people in bondage for so many years, bricks of straw indeed. The third head I would like to share as Babylon. Babylon that worshipped the sun and the sun god, who held the Jews captive for some 70 years, making slaves of them. And the fourth head, Persia. The Medes and Persians then next conquered the world. You remember in the story of Queen Esther during the reign of the Persians that all the Jews would have been exterminated were it not for Queen Esther. And that was the country that worshipped the sun god, Mithra. The fifth, I would say, Greece. You remember Phoebus Apollos and his chariot of gold that raced across the sky every day? Yes, the sun god indeed. It was one of the leaders of that country, Antiochus Epiphanes, that altered pigs on the altar in the Jewish uh, uh, temple. It was a terrible sacrilege. He was hard on the Jews indeed. And finally then, Rome, who worshipped Isis and Mithra. Rome that crucified the Christ and killed the apostles. Sun worship, blasphemy, oh yes indeed, for the emperors of Rome claimed to be God on earth. Hadrian claimed to be God and demanded to be worshipped. And then finally papal Rome, with all the sun customs involved in the religion. Went along for 1260 years without any civil intervention and finally in 1798 received the deadly wound. Now let's look at a red circle. Tonight's, uh, this study, 
We'll leave past history and get into the beast that receives the seven last plagues. After 130 years, the wound began to show signs of healing, and the beast began to assume new shapes. Benito Mussolini gave the Prince of the Vatican a small kingdom on the city of Seven Hills in 1929. But according to Revelation 17, I would not expect much advancement to the new world order and the final events of things until the sixth king is reigning. Present tense then will follow and persecution will follow today's events. No wonder John was so amazed. And to them it was given that they should not kill them. No, the 144,000 will not be killed, but persecution will be rampant. Many of their converts will certainly have to give up their lives, and some of them may be imprisoned. The Bible promises in Daniel that they, they will be given strength to do exploits. God's people will have special strength during this time. I want to be God's people, don't you? The Bible says they'll be helped with a little help, if you've studied in the past. A little help with God goes a long ways. And then in the end, we've studied in the past, they will bear one of God's own names. So a very special people will be developing on the world at the same time a new world situation is developing. And then as the persecution continues and some of the friends of God and some of your friends and my friends are put to death, Nothing new about that. There's been religious persecution all through the ages. But the text promises that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Oh, this time of persecution isn't going to last very long. Covenant with God right now to have no part in the rebellion that's taking place in planet Earth on the last days. Coming up is a picture of the whore's head. Here is a symbol of rebellion. Study it closely. Have nothing to do with it. Do not reflect the image. Do not reflect the symbology that's here. Now the woman does represent a church. And the church we're studying has worldwide influence. Her fornication is everywhere. All the world will wander after the beast. We've studied that before. In Revelation 17, she's pictured sitting on a city of seven hills, codenamed Babylon, with the added information that Satan himself will be her eighth king. Let me read verses 9 and 10 again while you watch the pictures on the screen. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now I realize this is very diagrammatic, but picture in your mind seven hills. And there are seven kings. All right, let's see seven kings come up. Now you see them pictured one on a hill. That's not correct. They're just seven kings. Though they are consecutive, <laughs> the hills aren't. But for diagram reasons, you see, there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is. Here he is, present tense. Some generation is going to see him. One is, and the other is not yet. Here comes number seven. And when he cometh, he must continue but a short space. Number seven may only be here a few weeks. Maybe a few days. Maybe a few hours. Maybe a year. I don't know, but it won't be very long. At the time this prophecy is to be understood, the sixth king is. The seventh has a short space, and the eighth one is Satan himself, also given in the present tense. And notice again in the eighth verse that the eighth king is given in the present tense. The beast that was, is not, and yet is. In other words, the angel speaks to a present generation in the present tense. A present generation is spoke to regarding the details of the sixth to the eighth king. What generation? And how do we know? Notice verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, yet he is the eighth, and is of the seven, the same lineage of the seven, all right, and goeth into perdition. Revelation 19 verse 20 says he will be cast into the lake of fire at the second coming. 
So obviously, the last generation is a generation given to understand this prophecy. In the book, Great Controversy, on page 624, I read these words, interesting from an author I think a lot of. Quote, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent of the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. I believe that's a pretty accurate statement. Though his home base will be in Rome, his influence will be worldwide. All the world will wonder after the beast and his image, his image of God's command. Now, what about the ten horns? We must take a close look at these ten horns, for they're different. There are differences in them regarding the other horns. Verse 12 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with a beast. They don't reign very long, do they? I'm not sure what an hour necessarily represents, but it represents a time period that isn't very long. Obviously, they don't last as long as the ten kings of Europe did, probably and not even as long as the three that were uprooted. Some wondered if these ten kings might be the ten kings of the common market. Not so for they receive kingdom only one hour with the beast, and they have no kingdom as of yet. Verse 13 says, These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The old European kings didn't do that. That's why three of them got uprooted. But in this case, all ten of them do. And then in verse 14, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him, that is, those that are on God's side, are called and chosen and faithful. We're looking at the final generation, folk, when Jesus comes and destroys this wickedness once and for all from ever affecting God's people. You and I have read of these kings in Revelation 16. In verse 14 and 15, it talks about them there. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, keepeth his garments, lest he shall walk naked, and they shall see his shame. Please, friend, do not have one dark blot on your garment. The only way you can have your sins washed away is through water baptism and a definite decision to walk with Jesus Christ and have him continually cleanse you and lead you in the paths of righteousness till you can stand firm for his name's sake. Heed the words of Jesus when he spoke them so seriously to that girl that was so happily forgiven when he said, go and sin no more. Now the text tells us that God's people who are on his side in this issue, are called, chosen, and faithful. John the Revelator, will you please explain what you mean? Of course. Of course he will. They are called out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and receive not of her plagues. You'll find that in Revelation 18. They are chosen. In Revelation 19, he chooses his bride. His bride is a chosen woman. They are his church. Number three, it says they're faithful. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They're called, they're chosen, they're faithful. The purpose of the true church today should be to encourage you and to help you to be among the called, the chosen, and the faithful. And the church should be doing everything in its power to encourage you in your true walk with Christ. Most of the world is under the influence of Rome's changed commandment, but not all. I was interested in something that I read, and I put it in the flyleaf of my Bible. This is from the Catholic Universe Bulletin, August 14, 1942, where it says, The Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. That's the claim. And then it goes on, the Protestant, claiming the, claiming the Bible to be the only guide to faith, has no warrant for observing Sunday. Well, those of you who have been studying your Bible with me know that already. 
And then it goes on to say, in this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant, end of quote. Well, that's not altogether true anymore. There are a lot of Sabbath-keeping organizations today. I mean, that quote was a long time ago, and there's been a lot of development since then. I want you to notice verse 15, please. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Wide is the gate, and the most people go through the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to Christ, and few there be that find it. Most will not believe the truth, even it's as plain as a nose on my face. Most will go along with the New World Organization and with the United Nations of the World having a united army to fight the wars. Most of them will go along with setting everything up, and most of them will be deceived by the evil angels that come to deceive us. But the elect those who follow God will be on his side. Now a new twist to our story develops. The ten horns that support the eighth king turn against the church that claimed him. That's an amazing surprise, isn't it? Verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's never happened in the past, folk. But it's going to happen and all the ten kings are going together to do it. They eliminate his little religious city, his first little empire. But they make up for it. They simply give him theirs. Verse 17, And God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. They simply give their crowns to the eighth king. No wonder then, when you see the final phase of the beast, the red beast with the ten horns, no wonder they have no crowns. They give them to the beast. The new world order will eventually be in his hands, in the hands of the eighth king. Remember, they had a king that reigned over him, them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. You know, it's not unusual for God to use wicked kingdoms to destroy a country that was once considered his, or once considered holy. Thus, Assyria was used to destroy Israel, and Babylon was used to destroy Judah, and Rome came in and destroyed the Jews in A.D. 70. It's not unusual for God to use wicked countries to destroy an area that was once holy. Verse 18 says, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Religiously speaking, what is the great city that has to do with Christ or an antichrist? You may wonder, how will the ten kings destroy this city codenamed Babylon? How are they going to do it? And how long will it take them to do it? The answers are given in a few verses in chapter 18. And I want you to see verse 8 first. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Now previously it said the ten kings were going to do it. Now it says God is the one that's judging. Yes, but God often uses other kingdoms to fulfill his judgments. In the eighth verse we read, she, she shall be utterly burned with fire. In the previous chapter said the ten kings will make her desolate, burned with fire and desolate. First she stands in beautiful splendor, next total destruction. Her plagues will come in one day. She will be utterly burned with fire. Verses 9 and 10 show there's danger carried in her smoke. For the smoke strikes fear in people that are standing clear on the other side of the world, or at least afar off, whatever that means. I don't know how far afar off is. In verse 9 and 10, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. What torment happened to her that's carried in the smoke that's going to worry people on the other side of the world? What have they done to her? How did they destroy her? What did they do to utterly burn her with fire? 
Remember, this book is written for the final generation, and only the final generation can totally understand it. Verse 18 and 19 says, they cast dust on their heads. Anything to get between them and the smoke, I suppose. Look at verse 18 and 19. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city, wherein were all made rich, all that had ships in the sea, by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Sudden destruction indeed. And notice verse 21, please. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. You notice he said like a millstone. It's not a millstone. He said like a millstone falling in a water. Boom, shh, it's all gone. But it's not a millstone. It's something the ten kings drop on the city. Well, it doesn't take a preacher to figure out what they drop on the city, does it? Think of Satan's concept. Here he sees humans, once created to bear the very image of God, forever able to, unable to bear that image. Killed within an hour. No further opportunity for repentance. But then this is the plague angel, and probation is closed anyway. They are the lost. Surely Satan is exhilarated as he sees so many lost humans swept into death to be raised in that most repugnant second resurrection of the lost. In verse 23 it says, And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For the merchants that were the great men of the earth, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Oh, friends, there is no healing of the deadly wound the second time around. Not at all. She shall be found no more at all. Now, what is God doing about all this? Why does he put all of this in the scriptures? To cause us to be frightened? Oh, no. To cause those who are joined with Christ to understand the truth. And notice in verse 4 and 5 of this 18th chapter, when you hear the mercy of God given so loud and clear, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. What are sins, folk? Sins are the transgression of God's law. We have been guilty, most of the world, of blaspheming God's most holy commandment, the only commandment of the ten who points out which God we're supposed to serve. And I'm sure Satan would like to have that commandment obliterated and changed because it is the commandment that points to the Creator God and the only one that does and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. Would you want to worship God as the creator of heaven, earth, and sea, as he asks? You do have a choice. Sin is the transgression of any one or more of God's commandments. The Sabbath is the one to be kept holy unto God that created heaven, earth, and sea. The problem with the mark of the beast is God says, Worship me as creator of heaven, earth, and sea. And they fornicated the command. They make an image of it, and they do something else. But it's not the only problem. Worshiping before images and idols breaks the second commandment. Death by persecution breaks the fifth commandment. Blasphemy, taking God's place, breaks the first commandment. And of course, the fornication of God's Sabbath breaks the fourth. Would you create or worship the creator of heaven, earth, and sea on his terms? Or would you worship on the terms of Babylon, the old city of the sun worship, and Nimrod? There is a beautiful text. You can almost feel God taking a sigh of relief. And the angel saying, oh, we're so glad. When you look down the story of the Mark of the Beast in Revelation 13 and you read from verse 6 to 12, there they are at last. And God is giving a smile where it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Where will you be standing when Babylon is destroyed? And I'm sure you'd like to know where the king goes to reign after his city is destroyed. For it doesn't destroy the eighth king when this thing falls on Babylon and blows it all to pieces and destroys it and the smoke carries the torment to the other parts of the world. No, no, the eighth king escapes out of that. 
he goes someplace else, and if you stay by and, and enjoy more of these good lectures, you'll see where he goes. Where will you be? Those who believe and know the truth will be totally united with it. Will they be persecuted for their belief? Scripture says absolutely. Will they go to heaven? Absolutely. Will they be ready for Jesus when he comes? Absolutely. Will you be one of those? What's your answer? I pray God you're saying absolutely. Now, why is the Lord revealing all of this information to us? I believe it's because we are the is present tense generation. Generation who needs to know the truth and see what's happening or what's developing on the planet Earth. Once the generation that's going to see the Antichrist start making friends with all kinds of nations that haven't been friendly before, you're going to see all kinds of things happening as the new world order continues to grow. Could this be that new world order? Or do we look for another? The time to accept the truth is now, or never is just around the corner. God is very serious about this issue. That's why there's so much in the Bible about it. And that's why such a strong appeal is made. Do you know the issue? Let's go back and see once again in Revelation chapter 13. Let's get it straight and see it simply as it's put. I have Revelation 14. Revelation 14, we're going to simply read a few verses starting with verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. I think that's so good of God to spend a, send a special message to planet earth, and it's the same everlasting gospel it's always been. It was in the Garden of Eden, and it's going to be in the earth made new as well. For Isaiah 66 tells us, as we worship together before God in the new heavens and the new earth, that we'll gather together before Him from one Sabbath to another. All flesh shall serve and obey Him. Friends, there's only one place you can be at that time and be happy to be with God. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him. He's been robbed of some glory. What glory has He been robbed of? For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and fountains of waters. How are you going to do that? This is the only command God gives regarding the mark of the beast. He says, worship me specifically as creator of heaven, earth, and sea. And friends, there's only one commandment in all of the Bible that tells us how to do it. God does not leave us hanging on questions. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord created heaven and earth and sea. This is the way to do it. In verse 8, Babylon causes all nations to go along in a fornication of God's command. And in verse 9 and 10, the dragon, the image, the Antichrist makes an image of it. He's trying to be an image of God, and he makes an image of his day of worship. And finally in verse 12, those who resist him, those I want you to stand with, those I want you to be praying with, here is the patience of the saints. Do you want to be one of God's real saints? Do you want to know what a saint is? God describes the saint in the 12th verse. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Would you be one of those? Would you step out from this world asking God to cleanse you, give you the power, and give you the grace to step out and keep His commandments with the faith of Jesus. You've already experienced the grace of Christ. You wouldn't even been listening if you haven't been. You've already accepted, most of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's wonderful. So many of you are accepting Him as Savior, but not Lord. In this verse, you see the people that have accepted him as both Lord and Savior. They not only accept salvation through Jesus Christ, but they accept him as their king and their Lord. Jesus said, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Here he's telling the final generation, keep my commandments and worship me as creator of heaven, earth, and sea. And those that are keeping all the ten as God gave them are worshiping him as creator of heaven, earth, and sea. That's why they meet every Saturday to worship on the Sabbath. I would like you to be with those people. I would like you to even be worshiping in your home on the Sabbath with a group of people. And bring them to church when you can, for there are Sabbath-keeping churches all around the world. 
someday, according to what we've read, persecution will come to God's commandment-keeping people. Between now and then, you need to gather up all the strength and courage and faith that you can to be ready. That's the purpose of the church. That's the purpose of meeting together. A few years ago, when Moses was alive and Joshua was about to begin to take the work of leading God's people, God told Moses to go down and encourage Joshua. Joshua was the greatest man in all the camp of Israel next to Moses, but God knew that Joshua needed human encouragement. Go to church on the Sabbath. Be encouraged. Our God in heaven, we thank you so much for the scripture, for the wonderful words of life that come to us from this book. We want to be on your side. We want, faith. We want to have the strength. We want to have the courage. We thank you, God, for anointing our eyes with eye salve that we can see what's going on around us. And we pray, God, that each time we see something that it strikes us not with fear but with courage and with gratitude knowing a God who knew the end from the beginning. We pray, God, that as we continue into this final generation that you will continue to open our eyes and continue to forgive us and lift us up to a point where we will be walking in your footsteps freely. For we ask it in thy holy name. Amen. Bible Explorations has made this videotape available. For sharing and viewing in your own home, just send $11 plus three dollars for shipping and handling. Send your order to Bible Explorations, P.O. Box 10965, Terabella, California, with a zip of 93270. Always include the title of the tape you're ordering. The title of this tape is The Final Rise of Antichrist. Two additional tapes we suggest for your viewing that concur with this tape are The Mark of the Beast and The Sabbath in the Time of Trouble. These two tapes are filled with the concern expressed in Revelation 13 and 14. Concern from the angels of God for earth dwellers in the time of the end. For any single tape, send $11 plus $3 shipping and handling. For multiple tapes, also send $11 per tape, but $5 for shipping and handling. And send your order to Bible Explorations, P.O. Box 10965, Terabella, California, with a zip of 93270.